Welcome back to Neuroconversant Leadership, where we talk about communication in the STEM fields. I'm Jeremy Doran, and I help practitioners in the STEM fields become leaders in the STEM fields. How many accountants do you know who are entertaining communicators? Well, you're going to meet one today. Trent Threw is not only a very accomplished accountant, he's also a leadership speaker, corporate MC, and all around great communicator. Welcome, Trent. Good morning, Jeremy. It is so great to have you here. Uh, we've known each other for, I'd say, about a year or so, but this is our first time to really dive into this topic. One reason why I think you are so particularly interesting is because you look and sound like you should be a senator or a CEO, and you have a background in accounting. And I'm, this you know, may be a surprise, but many accountants don't give off that similar vibe. I would never have guessed that. Yeah, well, surprise. Now, <laughs> now I'm going to let you know. So I'm wondering if you have any good stories about the people that you grew up going to school with or other accountants and how they communicate and if it was always a difference between you and them or if it's something you developed. Great question. The, the typical accountant is becomes very focused in, in, in their books and their studies and the like. But I had learned early on that it's only half the job to be able to make debits equal credits. The other half is you have to be able to communicate what it means. To be able to do that requires a set of skills that do not exist in general ledgers. And how did you learn those skills? I would just say that I was born or conceived or developed as a natural communicator. I'm an only child, which gave me a great person to listen to myself all the time. <laughs> and, uh, but, but it's just part of my personality. The fact that I gravitated to accounting, I think, is the choice. It's not the other way around. Uh, when I was in high school and looking for an elective, my mother had suggested accounting because she said, Trent, you can always get in a job in accounting. So I took accounting and I just carried that on to college because I was good at enough at it. Interesting. I, so completely opposite, I grew up as the youngest of 10 children. Mm. So I got to hear a lot of other people talking. And then I went into engineering, but I minored in psychology because I think much like you, I have a natural tendency to use both parts of my brain. And so it, it kind of made me a little bit of an oddball in the engineering group, but then the engineering side made me a little bit of an oddball with everybody else. Sure, sure, I understand. So when you are dealing with other accountants, what are some things they can do if they weren't naturally born with great communication skills? What can they do or what have you seen help them? So I work with quite a number of accountants, both ones that are just coming out of school and ones that have 20, 30 years in the business. And I can tell you that there is a distinction between them. When they're coming out of school, there is a timidity that is gen generally accepted that there's too much for them to learn to be an expert on anything. Whereas after 30 years in the industry, they've seen enough. There, there aren't that many different rules in accounting that a person with 30 years experience can't have seen the same situation 10 times already. So they have 10 times the comfort level to describe something. So I would say for newer accountants to be able to develop some of their skills is to specialize or understand one trait within accounting, whether it's FIFO or something. And from that, you would be able to be able to speak more generally and broadly about it. And then as you develop more of those building blocks, you'll be able to have more topics to speak about to higher ups or to clients. And that is a great strategy for anyone starting in a new job. If you become the expert on the one thing that most people don't know, then you always have a place and then you can expand it from there. Sure. It's a great anchor. It's a great anchor to work with. The other thing that you hit on is confidence. And confidence is so powerful in communication. You can see sometimes people are saying things and they're almost visibly leaning back because they're afraid of what they're saying. And some people just lean into it. And even if they don't necessarily have more knowledge, they just feel like they do. Jeremy, nobody knows more about what you're going to say than you. 
So sure. you have to be able to, nobody knows more about your topic than you, particularly if you're talking about yourself. So where accountants and other uh, of our STEM brethren can, can find themselves is, you know, start with themselves. That's a great story to tell, how you became the accountant that day. In my story, I had described it to you. My mother suggested she, I study something where I'd always have a job. She could have said I could be a, a biology teacher. She happened to say accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think you would have gone into biology if that's what she said? Well, not considering the grades I got in school, no. <laughs> Good answer. Okay. One thing you've mentioned is that you work with people who are new and fresh out of school for accounting and or have 30 years of experience. What are some things that the new people, in addition to honing in on one skill, can do just to become better communicators? So I, what I tell people and what I go and in, in, in lecture about this, it's about creating a one-minute story. And if you can create a one-minute story to communicate an answer, you will be um, well served. And each one-minute story should have four parts to it. It has the head to give them something to think about. It has the heart because you want to make your audience feel. It has humor to give them something to laugh, and it has to be hard-hitting because that's the point. And if you can integrate all four of those into a one-minute story, then you will become a magnificent communicator. And I tell people that develop dozens. I probably have a hundred one-minute stories that I can use and apply at any given time. So that way, you're not necessarily caught off guard. If you're in a meeting with a client and you're going to introduce and just have a little bit of rapport before you have to get down to, to the subject, you, know, you can talk about any one of these subjects for a minute to engage your client. And what you've done now is you've created a bond with that client that now moves aside some of the anxiety that you might have, and now you can get into the subject matter you're really strong about. But developing these one-minute stories is a wonderful and powerful way to develop your career with communication. That's fantastic. I often tell people to have a book where they have their stories or anecdotes and when you're going to a networking event, engineers hate going to networking events. I'm like, if you write down some stories, just read a couple of them before you go in, and then you will have things in your back pocket that when the topic comes up, you will have a quick story to tell. Um, but I love the way that you refined it down to having four parts to put you on the spot. Can you give us an example of one of your one minute stories? I will, I will. This. You only can see half of my clothing here. I went to Toronto with my wife last year. I have a speaking event that was coming and decided I needed some new clothing. And I went to a place that had a personal shopper. So we walked in and she picked three or four outfits out for me. And I came out and the pants were exceedingly tight. And I looked and I go, I can't wear pants like this. I'm a guy in my 50s. No good. And she looked at me and she walked me around and spun me once and she said, courage has no age. <laughs> and that rolled on my tongue. Courage has no age. She's right. And I handed her my credit card. Nice. That is a good salesperson. That's a one minute story that has head. My wife took me because... Uh, I needed I had an event. Uh, second, the heart, because she knows if you dress well, I'm going to do better, perform better. It's funny because, you know, imagining a man in skinny pants in his 50s, and it's hard hitting because courage has no age. Four things to have your listener. And that's an easy anecdote to apply, Jeremy, to a lot of places about confidence. But there are as I say, hundred of other ones. If you bring up a different topic, I would give you another one. And I particularly tell people when I uh, talk to, for example, people getting ready to come out of college, these are great items to have for interviews mm -hmm. because you're on the spot, they're asking you personal stories and the ability to give them a good story and wrap it up matters. Finishing matters, droning ons, one minute. Oh yeah. That is wonderful advice. I've been in networking groups where 
people are given one minute to give a pitch and they almost always go over and they're terrible. And then sometimes we'll say, you only have 30 seconds and they are fantastic because you have to prep it and you have to know when it's going to end and just being able to tie it all together makes it so much more powerful rather than just ending, um, I, I think, um, yeah, I'm done. It's like, okay. I just forgot all so the things I'll, you said. I'll already. ask you a question that I'll ask people to, about communicating. Can you describe yourself in three words? That's a great question. And I would say honest, earnest, and thoughtful. But I don't know how accurate that really is. But that's what came to my mind. But by the way, nobody else knows but you. <laughs> right. So honest, and earnest, so and thoughtful. To, to, to be able, you can break down and start a one-minute story by simply grabbing those three items. You know, what three items apply to you. And that way, you can have a building block right there for a story. Each of those three probably has a story for you. You could tell a story about honesty. And okay, you probably could. Yep. Great way for a, a STEM person or an accountant person to start building this repertoire of, of stories, anecdotes that will lead into be able to holding broader conversations like we're having right now. Yeah, I'm assuming you've read the book Made to Stick. Um, sure. And he just talks about the power of storytelling. And, and they did a study in a school and they had thousands of people do a presentation and something like 85% just stuck with facts. Mm -hmm. And the, the ones who told stories were, in this case, 12 times more memorable. And I've seen other studies where stories are up to 25 times as memorable as just facts. Sure, sure. Um, I, was, I was speaking to a group a couple weeks ago, and one of my, what I use is I tell practical proverbs. And they're simple, three little, um, three word, maybe four words top, and I have a story to go with it. For example, like the book I, I recently wrote called Eat Your Broccoli First. I mean, it's a pretty simple, but then you tell a story behind it and it connects about where priorities are in life or focus on the finish line is about distractions. And all of a sudden, you can reduce the story that happened to be about Michael Phelps to focus on the finish line to, oh, I know how I have to manage distractions as opposed to the data about, well, people that try to study while listening to headphones have a 12% or 15% reduction in capacity to, you're right, it fails. It fails to connect. Though, I like to listen to classical music when I'm trying to think deep thoughts. When I'm Because just, it expands you. Yeah. Um, because, is that because there's no particular melody that you are, your mind is going, jumping ahead towards? Yeah, I'm not singing along to it. Right. Um, so if I'm doing kind of menial tasks, then I'll put on heavy metal or whatever it is that I'm going to listen to. But if I need to actually think, classical music just helps open up my brain. Do you do other type of physical exercise maybe to help do that? Like go for a run or a bike ride without headphones? Yeah, I, if I'm on the treadmill, I use headphones because I hate the treadmill. Otherwise, right. I never do if I'm going for a run, a bike or a swim. And I can tell if I haven't been doing enough exercise because when I go for a run, if I haven't been, my brain is just filled with junk. And if I've been running often enough, then it kind of has all filtered itself out. And I can, that's when I come up with all my best ideas when I'm out I for know, a run or a bike. You sound like a ride. Jack Daniels distillery. That's how they do it. I, sometimes I have good ideas drinking Jack Daniels too. Well, that's a different story, <laughs> but then you probably forget to write them down. Well, I try to make sure I do. I, I speak into my phone. You were saying? No, I was saying, I, for, for me, the, what, what running does also is it helps me organize, particularly when I have to give a presentation and where I want to elect the right words. And by going for a run, for me, and I also swim quite a bit, I think, as you know, but, but when I go for a run particularly, I can organize the words into complete sentences. It avoids me using um, so, and uh, those type of filler words because the run has helped me organize them. When I present, then it becomes almost like I'm giving lines in a play. Hamlet wasn't saying to be, mm, um, he, the words come out, to be or not right. to be. That is the question. And when we're presenting, by having practiced a little bit, particularly 
through some type of meditation, whether it's a running or biking, or you will find that there is a better ability to deliver because I've learned that audiences, once you start on the yum train, they start picking that up and they start counting your ums or your uh, so's or but more than they're paying attention to what you're trying to communicate. I was talking to someone yesterday and when he was younger, he stuttered. And one, he was telling me a story about, I think it was Emily Blunt. And she became an actress because one of her teachers said, you will never stutter if you're reading a script. Wow. And so she started acting because she was reading a script and you would never know that she used to stutter. But I think ums and ahs are in some way related to stuttering, where if you really know what you're going to say, almost like it's a script, then there's no need for that. And exactly that is right. just a theory on my part. So if it's wrong to any listener, I apologize. I'm, I'm going to endorse that theory wholeheartedly. And if Jeremy's wrong, then I'll give you his address. <laughs> you're not going down in the boat with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe you. I, be I believe you. I, I said it and I, and I believe it. Even as we're talking extemporaneously, when, when two people are talking in a bar, there aren't a lot of ums and ahs because there's a comfort level. What changes that is the fact that there is no conversation when you're presenting. It's you to deliver material. And because of that, the less prepared you are, the more you're going to choose to fill those gaps with ums and ahs as opposed to periods. You can solve some of that, I believe, by, by practicing, whether you're treadmill or mediating, meditating or running or swimming or something of that ilk works for me. Or just actually practicing the presentation itself. Uh, yes. And I, I, people resist it. And they say, if I practice it too much, it's going to become stilted, like I'm reading a script. I'm like, no, no, the more you practice, the more natural you can be. It's when you're not really sure of all the content that you hem and haw. Amen. Every, by the way, if you've gone to Broadway, every script I've watched presented to me, there's been plenty of emotion to it. They're not right. still, it's because they know, because the words are inside of them, right. that they're able to give you the other blocking and emotion and feeling and you know, expression and the like. When I am doing a presentation, I know I'm really ready for it. If when someone asks me a question that is 12 slides ahead, I can easily go and talk about that and easily come back. Sure. If, if I feel stress and I need to wait and say, just, I'm going to get there. Let's wait till we get there because I'm not sure I can go there and come back. I know I haven't practiced enough. Of course. And, and you probably live this quite a bit when you're in front of a crowd exactly like that, right? Exactly like, you know, your material inside and out. You know it well enough that you can ad lib and come back. You can answer a question and come back without the audience knowing that that was a script. Because right. the, the role you're playing, the actor that you have in you delivering this, they won't know it. It'll feel 100% natural conversation to them. And effectively it is. Mm -hmm. Just right. not, not the exact planned one. Right, exactly. So can you tell us a little about your books and podcasts? I will. I have two books. One is called Filet to Finish, An Awkward Journey to the Iron Man. And it relates a story that I was paralyzed in an accident. And if you can tell, I'm standing now, so I'll spoil a little bit. I'm not paralyzed too long in the book. But one of the things that the book focuses on is I created a list while I was in the hospital. And maybe you've heard of the term bucket list, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that list name because it implies I was going to die, but I wasn't, I was going to live. And so I wanted to create a list of items that I was going to do because I was going to live. And so the first item in the list was walk, because I thought that was a good place to go. It's a great place. <laughs> walk, climb a flight of stairs, uh, lift my children, go to work, be with my wife, go see the Red Sox. And I said, I've done all those before. So I created a few other ones like run a marathon, climb a skyscraper, do the Ironman, and complete some unprecedented swim. And I didn't know what that was yet. But that's what this book focuses on a little bit. And I say, if you write it down, 
if you write your coming attractions down, you'll make them happen. But if you just think these things to yourself, you just often wish them away. And so that's what the first book relates to. The second book is titled Eat Your Broccoli First, Practical Proverbs for Developing Resilient Leaders. And that's what I do. I develop resilient leaders. I help companies foster their talent before they have to replace it. And this is a series of essays, 40 essays, that, that exactly do some of what I described earlier, whether it be your broccoli first, focus on the finish line, keep your antenna connected, simple parables that have a story with them. It takes a behavioral economic theory, applies a empirical business study to it, and then I wrap it up in a humorous, or at least humorous to me, personal anecdote. I like that. Yeah. And my podcast is weekly. It's called Swimming in the Flood. And you can find it on Spotify, Pandora, Dozer, whatever, all the major iHeartRadio. And they're 10 minutes. And essentially, it's the same as what the book is. So in 10 minutes, you can get those. So last week, it was titled Never Into the Net. And it followed setting goals higher for yourself as opposed to a little bit lower. Stretch goals. And then it relates into the story about Andre Agassi's father who brought him a, a machine to hit ball, throw balls back to him and he raised the net four inches. Basically oh. because if you put the ball into the net, you never give yourself a chance to win the point. Yep. You always concede it. And so his father conditioned that differently. So Andre would always be the point. And at the same time, if it was a negotiation, by getting the ball back over the net, you give both sides the opportunity to win. So that's what my podcast focuses on. I like that. All in 10 minutes, you can get on your car ride to work. And I'm guessing the audience wants to know, because I want to know, what is the big swim thing that you ended up doing? I did a couple. The first one I did was I swam an event we titled Back to Block. I swam backstroke from Point Judith, Rhode Island, to Block Island. Wow. And I decided I was going to raise money for a foundation I created in Boston at the Spalding Rehabilitation Center called Rise Above Paralysis. We raised $50,000 in that swim to provide money for durable medical goods. These are items that are not covered by insurance. Here's the reason why. When I came home from the hospital, I couldn't walk up the stairs. And so I needed to sleep essentially in the dining room. Mm -hmm. And we I needed a special bed and rented it. Jeremy, it was $1,200 to rent that bed for a month. Whoa. And I said, I was comfortable enough to be able to afford that. But the thought behind it said, what about the machinist that gets in a bicycle accident, motorcycle accident, and can't walk? He's not maybe having those same funds. That's what my swims did. And I've went and did a few other ones. I've did the English Channel. I swam around Aquidneck Island 41 miles. And most recently, last year, I went from Long Island to Rhode Island across a shark migration pattern in the Atlantic. <laughs> but uh, to collectively, we've raised about $500,000 for this. And the reason is I I swim because I got out of the wheelchair, and I swim for those who cannot. That is wonderful and scary, what you've done. So <laughs> I learned to swim strictly so I could do triathlons, but I've never been comfortable at it, and I can't even imagine doing those things that you've done. Well, I, I, I was able to swim earlier by, by grace, time, and hard work and resiliency, I was able to put myself back in a position to do these swims. I've done some Ironman as well. I have a nickname on the Ironman course. It's called On Your Left. Because <laughs> that's what the bikers say to me. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were the one who said it. <laughs> <laughs> Going back earlier, we were talking about how running, biking, swimming without headphones helps you to put sentences together effectively. For me, what it does in presentations is really sift through my thoughts. If I've got a presentation to do and there are 
potentially 25 different points I could make. Running gives my brain the space to filter it through and figure out here are the three key things that may tie in a number sure. of the others, but these are the things that it needs to boil down to. That's, that's kind of what running does for me. And I think that for a lot of people who are going to do presentations, as you said, if they don't run or bike, find some way to have quiet time to yourself. Go for a walk, do something and just let your brain do what it's supposed to do. It is. It's the, it's the change in brain waves from be actively being on your phone or actively having uh, some stimulus to what happens. The, uh, the delta waves that come in that are longer and allow deeper thoughts. It, and I agree with you. It, it doesn't have to be a bun, run, bike, swim, a six-hour training session. It can just be a walk around the park. A walk to the corner and back sometimes is enough to set that apart, I find it critical. Yeah, and just kind of getting out of whatever rut your brain was in mm -hmm. just allows you to, to process better. Sure, absolutely right, absolutely. Trent, this has been fantastic, but we're gonna need to start wrapping up in the interest okay. of everyone's time. So right. I'm going to start with asking you the three questions I ask everybody. I'm ready. First one is part A and B, a place you love to go and a place you haven't yet been but want to go. Okay. Uh, I love to go. I love to go to the Disney area. And I go to, there are so many things to do there, but what I've come to appreciate as I get older is I just love watching little kids. I was there in January and Snow White was um, just out there greeting, and the three-year-old girls that were just jumping up and down for Snow White just made me feel wonderful. Uh, about it. And it had nothing to do with the rides. It's just watching the joy in the children. So that's, that is something. Uh, where would I like, where do I want to go? Um, I would like to say, I'd like to go into space. I cool. would like to get on Blue Origin and with, with Jeff Bezos next to me and say, you know, and, and Shatner, who was on that one time and go, a head full. <laughs> Make it so. Make it so. I like that. That is an answer I have not yet gotten. So thank you for that. Sure. On the watching little kids, I found that most adults are pretty boring. They've lost their sense of wonder, their curiosity, and that is one thing that is so great about kids. I wish sure. more adults would remember how to bring that back. It seems like you have for sure. I, yeah, I, it's a great way. It's a great fill. Now, I still scream my head off when I get on Space Mountain or something like that. And yeah. I still get giddy about going out there and doing all the different things. And it doesn't even have to be in a theme park. There, I, I go play the miniature golf that I have down there. So it has its own Disney imagination version of it. And, or just go ride the, uh, the sky lift that the new one they have. It's uh, just being a part of that buzz is exciting. Fun. All right, question two is, yes. who do you think is a great communicator? Can be personal, historical, famous, anything? Um, I would say that um, one of my favorite communicators is, is Antonin Scalia, who is a former Supreme Court justice. And the reason that I would elect him is because he could take the most complex legal arguments and break it down into something that two people in a bar could understand completely. So he's, he's providing a very practical example to how to reason through the law, which too many times we as experts, engineers, lawyers, accountants, will gravitate towards acronyms and complex ways because it kind of fills our ego a little bit to be able to show how smart we are when I think the real intelligence is to be able to make it your thoughts and your feelings or your examples accessible to all. That is a rare and wonderful skill to have. Yeah. So the final question is what is one piece of communication advice we can all benefit from? Well, I'll go right back to create your collection of one minute stories, four parts, head to make them think, heart to make them feel, humor to make them laugh, and hard hitting. It was Jeremy, that's the point. Nice, I like that. All right, how can people learn more about you online, either reaching out to you or just learning more? The best way is you can check out my website at trenttheru.com. You'll find 
information about my video, uh, videos, my speaking, my teaching, and my podcasts that are there, or my books, that's a great way to go see me. Otherwise, you can just go meet me at the Bay. We're going to get in the water next month, so you know, come on down. What day, what time? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, April 1st at uh, 6 in the morning. Oh, boy, that is going to be cold water. Good luck. <laughs> Thank I'll, you. I'll see you in June. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Trent, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to put in the show notes uh, a link so that people can reach out to you. Really appreciate all the insight you've shared. Thank you so much. I enjoy the time. Thank you for having me. Thank you to your audience as well. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to Neuroconversant Leadership. If you found this beneficial, can you do me one small favor? It'll be quick, I promise. Can you go and give this podcast a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever it is that you listen before doing anything else? Unless you're driving. If you're driving, then I need you to keep driving. And then when you're done and parked, then go ahead and give me a, a review. Hopefully five stars, but whatever you are comfortable honestly giving. Thank you and have a great day.